Once again, I'm glad you're here today. You're glad to be here today? Well, I hope that continues as we now continue our study of Rep. Love. Before that, um, I do feel I want to honor that as a country, we honor those who have given their lives for the freedom that we are able to experience as a country. If you have a loved one that gave their life uh, for this country and their freedom, would you just raise your hand uh, in the service? God bless you all. God bless you all. In, in fact, I, I uh, put this picture up. I hope we have the picture there. That says, uh, Memorial Day is a day that's set aside to remember with gratitude and pride all those who served and died for our country and our freedom. May your day be filled with memories and peace. God bless America. Is it up there yet? Well, that's what it says. And, uh, <laughs> but I really wanted this next picture. Paul, we doing okay? Well, I can tell you what the picture is, and it's basically a, wi a young widow laying at the grave of her, uh, her fallen husband, soldier. And so the caption read, uh, it, it's hard to say happy Memorial Day. So we say a blessed Memorial Day to honor those who served. And I'd, I'd just like to lead us in prayer again. Lord, um, praise your name. Lord, we didn't choose where we're born. You allowed us to be in this country, and uh, not just freedom as citizens, we are freed in Christ that Lord now is part of his family and, and citizens of heaven. Oh God, we, our words are insufficient. And, and to get there, not just the soldiers who died, but you sent your son to die for us. We just celebrated that in baptism. Help us never to forget the tremendous price you paid for us. We love you, God. Praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. There's a, there's a picture. Well, what a joyous morning we've had, and, uh, but when you're preaching through the Word of God, with joy, we're jumping into Revelation chapter 16 about the first bowl of wrath, which is the sores, and so, uh, but there's joy in the Scriptures, I promise, because the Scripture teaches us that we'll be blessed as we study the book of Revelation. A lot of difficult passages, but... Um, I, I feel in these passages, reading two verses today, let me read our introduction. In Revelation 15, the Apostle John saw the seven angels having the seven last plagues, showing the wrath of God is complete. And as we get through this, we get into chapter 17, 18, 19, we get toward the battle of Armageddon, uh, the end of time, basically. Um, but these are God's final messengers of judgment, and that the plagues are no longer for the purpose of conviction and conversion, but are a pure expression of the vengeance of a holy God. In Revelation 16, which we'll read today, the final wrath of God poured out brings a new level of suffering and destruction to the earth. So part one, we talked about a few weeks ago, was sacred suffering, and this our series called Truth or Consequences. I really should have named it Truth and Consequences of the truth that we follow in Jesus Christ or don't, and there's consequences for both. So let's read uh, 16, Revelation 16. Hope you have your Bibles. We'll read the first two verses. John says, Then I heard a loud voice from, temp from the temple saying to the seven angels, and this is God's voice, Go pour out the bowels of the wrath of God on the earth. So the first went, poured out his bowl upon the earth, and a foul and loathsome sore came upon the men who had the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. Well, where we find ourselves, we've talked about the tribulation being seven years. Now we're turning the corner. We've had several chapters of interlude. We see uh, the introduction. This comes from verse by verse. Ministry is a great summary. Uh, Satan has resurrected the Antichrist, is indwelling his body. With Satan's power, the Antichrist is ruling the world, being celebrated as the Messiah and Savior. Satan has raised up a false prophet to lead the world in a new religion that worships the Antichrist. One's called the beast from the sea, the other the beast from the earth. A supernatural image, as we're going to talk a little bit about today, the image in the Jewish temple and homes to remind people of the new God of the world. The world is called to worship this new God, will take a mark indicating their willingness to worship him, and if a person refuses, they cannot buy or sell. Once found, they are beheaded. Very difficult time in, in the scriptures. Now, as we look at our chart here of time that Christ will come for his church. 
The groom will come for his bride who is to be prepared. The uh, tribulation will begin three and a half years and then the abomination of desolation appears and this is the Antichrist who basically sets himself up as God over the world to be worshiped and then we see these bowls. We've had the seals, we've had the trumpets and now the bowls literally of God's wrath. You know the, the word wrath, it, it means passion. And I didn't want to be uh, cutesy with the title of part two, but I, I, here's my title, Sore Subject. And a sore subject is when we read this, not just the bodies of those who followed the Antichrist were then infested with sores, but the difficulty as we read that of thinking, oh, that's, that's not a merciful God, that's not a loving God, he would not do this. And so that's the points we're going to go through. But the bottom line to me for these verses isn't about the wickedness, isn't about God's judgment, which is very thematic. It's about worship. Because the very last part of verse 2 said that the sores came upon the men who had the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. So when we think about applying what's going on here in the end times, and as the church is raptured, whether or not we experience that, there are those who have different beliefs on it, how can we apply what happens with God's wrath to how we live today? Because Jesus talked about, and if you don't believe it, you should, the spirit of Antichrist is present today. Anti-Christ, those that deny the Christ don't want to have anything to do with Jesus, want to live life their own way, and in if they live to this time, would then suffer because they've made the choice. You know, when they talk about the mark of the beast, it's some kind of tattoo or physical mark, well, up to the left, it's on the right hand or on the forehead, so it would be visible, and the scripture says that they would not buy, could not buy or sell without that mark. But key to that mark is not just the commerce, and we'll talk about that as we get on into the different bowls of wrath, it's the worship. It's choosing to follow this one who will be an eloquent speaker and display the powers that we see in God. Satan's a great deceiver and will follow him. And in that, God brings his wrath. As we think of this sore subject, let's look at point number one. It's a sore subject because this is God's declaration to the world. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying of the seven angels, go, pour out the bowls of wrath of God on the earth. As we talked about last week, the vision of a holy God. We see the temple, symbolic of the temple that was on the earth, and when God's cloud descended on that temple, it was called the Shekinah glory. And we see here in Revelation, the temple is filled with smoke. That's verse 8. I read that. The temple is filled with smoke from the glory of God, from his power. No one was able to enter the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. This is a sore subject. Oh, this glorious, almighty, loving, powerful God is going to issue this declaration from heaven? Well, he does. Go, pour out the bowls of the wrath of God on the earth. Also notice, no one was able to enter the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. Second subpoint of this declaration is the vengeance of a holy God. In other words, all that we see, the good against evil, the darkness against light, God will prevail. If you don't hear anything else today, all that's going on in what seems so hopeless, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Pray to God that he would come quickly and take us home. But until then, living in the light of his holiness and being vengeful. Look at Deuteronomy 6, 14. You shall not go after other gods, the gods of the peoples who are all around you. Obviously referring to the children of Israel, the same principles. And when we think about worship, well, I'll get there in just a moment. Verse 15, For the Lord your God is a jealous God among you, lest the anger of the Lord your God be aroused against you and destroy you from the face of the earth. God is righteous and holy and merciful and just, but he still hates sin. That's why Jesus had to come, because he had to pay the price because he's a holy God, and it's in that. Boy, praise God for the symbol of baptism. The physical symbol of a heart changed, a heart forgiven, a heart made new. 
Yes, from this holy and loving and powerful God, but he's also a jealous God, and he demands our obedience. And so here is his declaration to the world. And believe me, it's a sore subject for people who want to get away with their sin. Does that make sense? Let me give you an example. In the Sun paper this week, maybe not known this, but Maryland's final death row inmate won't face, won't face execution. The last Marylander to sit on death row no longer faces the ultimate penalty. Federal prosecutors signaled Wednesday that they will no longer pursue the death penalty against a 41-year-old Maryland man who was sentenced to be executed for his role in the 2002 kidnapping and murder of a D.C. police lieutenant's son. And so he remained on death row and now is scheduled for a resentencing in June because a judge threw out his death sentence last year. And then, if you read more recent, um, Marilyn Mosby, who's been in trial, and the, I do my scanning on Thursday, the sentence these looms, Marilyn defends her legacy because she was going to prison. Well, district judge sentenced her to 12 months of home confinement, 36 months of supervised release for making a false mortgage application, two counts of perjury. I read those to just say, I feel like it's the attitude, well, of course this man on death row had to be cheering, that, well, this is what we deserve, but... God will really come through and be merciful. God's not really going to do this. And folks, as we read the scriptures, this is going to happen. Sheep separated from the goats, there will be a, a, the throne of judgment, and those that are, are not followers of Christ will be sent to a Christless eternity. Weeping and gnashing of teeth, and those who follow Christ will rejoice in abundance with him forever. And we're seeing this come to this point of closure as God steps forth to say, now the time is ending. In fact, if you just look forward to verse nine, uh, when they talked about they had the plagues, the power of these plagues, they did not repent and give him glory. And on down in verse 11, they blasphemed the God of heaven because of their, their pains and their sores and did not repent of their deeds. In other words, time is up. Temple doors are closed. God's sending out his wrath and this is his declaration to the world. Now we don't start there. When we're sharing the love of God and sharing the good news of Jesus Christ, you know, uh, we don't just say, well, you're a Christ follower, and they say, no, well, you're going to get sores one day, buddy. We, you don't go there. But in the discussion, as we talk about the love of God and how he sent his only son and Jesus paid the price for us, in fact, the, the word is very similar to the lashings that Jesus took that literally lacerated his flesh that by his stripes we are healed. That as we go through that and how God loves us and how God sent that, that there is, and I'm just gonna get to point number two, a destructive wrath for those who choose not to follow Christ. And that's what we're seeing here again. So the first went, poured out his bowl upon the earth, and a foul and loathsome sore came upon the men. That word foul, the Greek word is literally pronounced helkos. It means an ulcer, a wound, a festering sore. It's very similar to what Job had when we talked about the sores that God allowed and Satan was uh, dealing with him. It's the same when uh, Aaron and Moses, and, and when they were going to come out of Egypt and the sores that came on the Egyptians, very similar word. That's the, uh, the foul, loathsome, literally means evil. It, it's properly an inward, rotten, poisoned inner malice flowing out of a morally rotten character. You know, I never thought of my father as a theologian, but whenever I'd have something wrong like that, I'd get a boil or a sore, and he'd say, well, that's just the meanness coming out of you. Yeah, I thought, oh, well. And now as I read this, I thought, well, Dad was right. Man. Bad, evil, and then... Uh, the sore came upon then, the, it, the toilsome, bad, evil, wicked, malicious, slothful sores. Now, you know I love the commentary of Henry Morris. He, he is a, he's a scientist and theologian, and he always has a slant on things that I, I really enjoyed. He says, um, at first the angel goes forth from the temple, his great bowl overflowing, he flies swiftly around the earth, tilting the bowl here and there until every portion of the earth has received some of its bitter contents. 
Boy, can't you picture that? Finally, the bowl is drained. Its awful mixture proceeds to accomplish its ordained mission. The work is to spread a hideous and painful infection on the bodies of men and women everywhere. The infection manifests itself as a loathsome ulcer of some kind, eating into the skin, seemingly malignant and unresponsive to medical treatment. The record does not specify the exact nature of these sores, probably because they are unprecedented and therefore unnamed. The most amazing aspect of them, however, is that they, like the trumpet judgments, which did not affect those that had received God's seal, will not affect those who have refused the mark of the beast. Although it's impossible to be certain, listen to this, it may be well be that the very process which men had received this mark had rendered them susceptible to these unique sores. The mark had been permanently affixed to the skin like a tattoo, and something in the chemicals or in the marking process, possibly irradiation because of the government's mandate to mark billions of people rapidly, may have entered their bloodstream. The angel with the plague, knowing the nature of this poison, could then release some other agent into the atmosphere which would specifically and quickly react with all human bodies so affected causing them to break out in these loathsome and penetratingly painful sores. You don't believe God is awesome and perfect, that then the bowls is produced and this destructive wrath is for just those who've taken the mark of the beast and those who have not remained clean. I said it earlier, this is from MacArthur, that the, the boils that plagued the Egyptians, same word, afflicted Job, uh, describes the open sores that covered the beggar Lazarus. You get the picture. And it's with those people who had the mark of the beast. Well, what is that? It's purposeful. It's prophesied. It, it's the response. Let's read Zephaniah chapter 3. Therefore, wait for me, says the Lord, until the day I rise up for plunder. My determination is to gather the nations to my assembly of kingdoms, to pour on them my indignation, all my fierce anger. All the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. Is that not a God who cares about good and evil? Judging sin and forgiving for righteousness? Look at verse 9. For then I will restore to the peoples a pure language, that they may all call on the name of the Lord to serve him with one accord. I read this last sermon when we talked about, as we began this series, it's the purging of rebellion. Romans 12, 19. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, vengeance is what? Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And when Jesus talked about that, he then said, okay, well then we're to love our enemies. And we see this through revelation of the prayers of the saints saying, God, when will this judgment come? And well, now we're seeing it's, it's, it's going to come. God pouring out of the bowls of wrath on the earth, his destructive wrath. Merciful, yes. Loving, yes. But his destruction will come. I don't know, probably many of you have been affected by it, but I thought it was, uh, the headline just reads that um, data reveals the impact of the collapse of the key bridge on traffic. How many of you know that data firsthand? Of course you do. I read that and think, oh my goodness, that's just, uh, and the second headline reads this, and it has to do with now all the chemicals in our, in our life, and it simply says, your toxic life. We live in a sin-infested world. We all sin before God. We all deserve his destructive wrath, but because of the blood of Jesus, we have his forgiveness. So we have this declaration, we have this destruction, and now what I believe is the most important point is it comes upon those who take the mark, and again, we often talk about the mark simply to say, oh, you can't buy and sell. Well, Pastor, what if this happened while we're still on this earth? What will we do? Well, we need to back up one step further because it's not just about the commercial part. It is sig signifying giving your heart and worship to the Antichrist. And so this sore subject that I'm just going to bring up is what I'm entitling disobedient worship. A foul and loathsome sore came upon the men who had the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. Do you remember God talking about worshipping an image? Does anything come to mind? You know, we talk a lot about, I guess in this political season, the second 
amendment. How about the second commandment? Well, let's read that together. The expectation of the Father who gave his command to the children of Israel and the Ten Commandments are still in effect. Exodus 20, 3 through 8, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. And, and notice how many verses he takes with this principle. Not just thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not seal, but these three verses. You shall not bow down to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. There it is, just like in Zephaniah. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children of the third and fourth generations of those, look at this, who hate me. Oh, it's just a simple little idol. Well, you know, we pray to this. It's, it's, you're saying you hate him. But showing mercy to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. And, well, I'm just going to read on. Verse 7 and 8, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. It, it, it means, uh, th that word there, it's emptiness. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. And then verse 8, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And we don't have time to preach through the Ten Commandments, but these first commandments are very clear about the expectation of the Father is to worship him. Put him first in all things. Let no thing come before our relationship to him, even if it's making something or anything that would be important to us, more important to God himself. And of course, as he's saying this, children of Israel living among peoples who just had multiple gods and made these idols, but now when we talk about the image that they're worshiping, well, let's... Well, let me finish this. this. This expectation in worship is that then we would have this expression of faith. And I'm just going to read Romans 8, 14 and 15. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. Well, let's talk for a moment about it. And boy, we just don't have time to get into all the details. But the Antichrist... Again, the, the one who is anti-Christ, that doesn't acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the Savior, um, rises from the sea, has the horns, and the, uh, the second beast comes out different. He has the two horns and, and is as a lamb. We call him the false prophet, and he's the one that then brings forward to the world to worship the image of the beast. In a nutshell, the Antichrist represents, and some feel it does represent, a system. A system that is another religion that is against the world politically, and the Antichrist then is that head over everything in this time. The second beast, and this is all from Revelation 13, we've talked about this before, but we'll keep repeating it because it bears repeating. Two horns like a lamb spoke like a dragon. The comparison to a lamb shows this beast appears to be like Jesus, the true lamb of God, yet instead speaking the actual word, instead of speaking the words of Christ, speaks word inspired by Satan, the great dragon. Just a perfect example of a wolf in sheep's clothing. What will this image be? Well, for those who feel these are world systems, politically, religiously, it will be some form of religion that will put its faith in something that looks very Christ-like, but is not. The political system, to have someone who speaks eloquently and performs miracles, and then demands this mark. Satan inspires the false prophet to seal the worshipers of Antichrist, to protect them from the wrath of Antichrist. The Greek word literally means a mark, engraved, etched, branded, imprinted. The mark, hear this, will identify all who worship the Antichrist. It will certify their loyalty, their allegiance to him, and the worshipers of Antichrist will receive that mark. Folks, I, I believe that's the essence of being disobedient in worship. And so the question comes, I've written it here, with whom or what do we identify? That's what the word image means. Remember when Jesus talked about paying uh, taxes, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's? He took the coin, and what did he say? Well, whose image is on that coin? It's just the same word. Well, Caesar. Well, you render unto Caesar. So not sure what the false prophet will do to create this image. Will it be a statue? The scripture says that it will speak, it doesn't say come to life, but it says it will speak something miraculous that the world then will turn and worship. 
Well, between now and then, and we don't have any statues here to worship, but we all have to ask ourselves the question, so what do we worship? Are we being authentic? Do we know that when we come into this building, thank God for this building, that the altar is really on our hearts. The Holy Spirit dwells within us. God is the audience. We're becoming before Almighty God, and it's His image we want to live in and not anything else that will get in the way. You know, we were uh, all shocked with uh, Chris's announcement last week about moving on to plant millions of churches. God bless you, Chris, I'll tell you. And so as we... Uh, or we're going to be looking for a new worship leader. My son does that in Alabama, and I was talking to him this week about it, and he said, Dad, and I don't think he'd mind me quoting him because um, he is also in situations of helping other people with worship since he leads worship. He said, we so created a uh, culture of entertainment in the church that as I talk to young men, they're just looking for another gig. Whoa, my heart just sank. This is not a performance. This is an encounter, an expression of our faith with Almighty God. Those who pass through the baptismal waters, that's obedient to Scripture. Two or more are gathered. We bring our praises and our songs to Almighty God that we might give Him our praise together. That we can't do by ourselves. Yes, we can praise by ourselves, but there's something about being in God's presence together. The Bible says don't forsake assembling together. It's, it's crucial that that, that image is not of the world, but of the Lord. Are you with me? So when we plan, when we talk about the scriptures and talk about the songs, it's leadership to say, how can we worship Almighty God in spirit and truth? A matter of the heart and the mind. Can we engage with Almighty God? I believe with all my heart to sit under the, you know, before we started Crossroads, I think I told you the story. My wife and I, we visited 27 different churches. We wanted to see what God was doing in different places. And all I can say is, number one, when they talk about using your gifts, it was really hard to sit where you're sitting because I'm thinking, well, I, I, that's what I want to do. But also learn this. When I'd open my word and the preached word would come from the pulpit, there's something about being in the presence of others and the presence before God that God deals with our hearts. It might be something like reading the scripture and look at the page next. That's why I love a physical Bible. You can't do that digitally. And you all have done it to me as well. I'll think it's a glorious sermon on sores and somebody will come up and say, oh, I feel led to restore this relationship with my neighbor. Well, that might be a sore subject too, but that, it had nothing to do with sores. Because what did Jesus say? The spirit moves where it wishes. Our desire is to align ourselves with how it's guiding us. And folks, that's obedience in worship. Are we singing before an almighty God that we know, before a Savior that we love, that we uh, don't deserve his love, we don't deserve his forgiveness, but he gives it to us, and therefore we have this expression of faith. So there's that question, whom or what do you identify with? And I'm not talking to nomination, not even talking about the building. This isn't our identity. Our identity is in Christ. And then the second part, for whom or what do you influence? We're being changed so that we might be witnesses in the world. God is using us in worship to align us together to figure out the purpose that he's doing with us so that we might give him honor and glory. And his wrath is poured out on those who say, uh-uh, I'm following after the beast. And so as we sit here and think, I wouldn't do that. Well, be very careful because the ways of the world, Satan's very deceiving, and this image, I believe, will look very Jesus-like. In fact, I'll just touch on it right now, but I, I've said this before, the Muslim religion, Islam, which totally denies Jesus being the Son of God, to me, encapsulates the spirit of Antichrist. Did you know that they're expecting Jesus to return as well? Did you know that? They don't believe, this is according to their doc doctrine, they don't believe that he's the son of God. They believe that, just like Elijah, that God took him. Didn't die, so he didn't raise again, didn't die for our sins, that he was a prophet, but he's coming again. And guess what they believe about his coming again? That he is going to tell the Christians and the Jews that they were wrong because he isn't the son of God, didn't die for them, and to convince them of being Muslim. 
That's the Muslim belief. Using Jesus. So again, when we think of just, and boy, we can go, they have also believe in a Mahdi, they're, they're believing in a Messiah coming, that's before Jesus. Just so many things that are totally opposite of what we believe as Christians, and then it's anti that belief. And we see that with the Antichrist, the prophet, the dragon, Satan as God, Antichrist as Christ, our Jesus, and then um, the false prophet who stands for the Holy Spirit. He's just deceiving on the levels that we believe of what's true. So as we worship, as we read these about the sores, now I'm not saying today if you don't worship truly and God's going to give sores all over you. That, but, but God does discipline and God does convict and God does lead. And God may lead somebody into your life to say, why don't you go to church? Why aren't you worshiping with us? And boy, it'd be a hard thing to say, well, I'm just being disobedient. No. No. You know, we sent out flyers, and uh, boy, I was really proud of our Easter flyers. I didn't scan it, but many of you even got some to come to our Easter services, and many of you might have come because of them. Just, I love being able to put out mail. Everybody likes getting mail. Well, we actually got one in the office this week, and it's from the Church of Scientology. Well, if we can send out flyers, free country, they can send out flyers. But here's, here's what it says. I, I put the scan up here. We, oh, I guess, I, yeah, there it is. We may believe differently, but we all believe in a better world. Oh, that's not nice. I, I didn't really know what, know what they believed, so I looked it up. Here's what Scientology believes. Man is basically good. He is seeking to survive, and that his survival depends on himself and his attainment of brotherhood in the universe as stated in the creed of the Church of Scientology. According to their beliefs, it is based on a blend of science and spirituality, which makes sense, with belief in an immortal spirit and improving that spirit here on earth using Scientology's methods. Scientists, Scientologists do not believe, do not typically dwell on heaven or hell or the afterlife, instead focusing on the spirit. Many so so Scientologists also belong to other churches and encourage it. So they go through a whole list of here what they believe. So um, but what, what hit me through all of this is survival. They affirm the existence of a deity without defining or describing it by nature. And the one Scientologist, Ron Hubbard, wrote in his book, The Science of Survival. It's Jesus talking about who would give up or gain the whole world, give up his life to gain the whole world, or misquoting it, sorry about that, of surviving self and then lose eternity, gain the whole world and lose eternal life. That's what I'm reading here. It's not about ourself. It's about our trusting in Christ. He is God. He came to this earth to give us this gift. And to just say it doesn't really matter, let's just, let, we all believe in a better world and, and go down a path that's not according to what we know f truth to be. And if you say to me, well, Pastor, I can be so judgmental, I'm hoping giving you an example. When you get something in the mail, the first thing you do is say, and how does it compare to what the Bible says? The Bible says it's not about ourself. It's about dying to self, taking up a cross daily and following him and putting our trust in him because the world is going to get worse. God's judgment will come. Oh, that's a sore subject, of course. God wouldn't do that. Well, he's already promised he's going to do this, and there will be a time when there's no more opportunity to repent. Do you hear that? There'll be a time when there's no more opportunity. Because of those, I'm reading the conclusion, who took the mark of the beast, refused to worship the true God and creator, Jesus Christ, Choosing rather to worship the great image of the beast, the time of judgment, judgment had come on them. Revelation 16. Since they identified with the beast by his mark, God added his own mark to their bodies. Terrible sores, which by their disgusting appearance would truly reflect the character of the humanistic God they preferred. Were they fearful of the persecutions? They would endure by refusing to worship the beast? Well, then God would send them far more intense suffering, which was a painful sign of that which is to come. From this point on, no one who had received the beast mark would be able ever to forget the consequences of the awful choice he made. And we'll be talking about that in the weeks to come, the next bowls. Here's our question. How are our choices to worship God or not worship God affecting us? 
because he's made his declarations. He said this is what his wrath is about, his passion, his love for us, and yes, his hatred of sin, and so how are we worshiping him? Let it not be a sore subject for us, but one of obedience and one of trusting and one of following him as he gives us through his word, his guidance, and his love. Let's pray. Lord, we know in your word we are saved by your grace through faith, not of yourselves, not of ourselves, it's a gift of God. It's your gift, not a result of works, lest any man should boast. And we, we see just the deception in our world today. We don't have to wait till all that's happening in Revelation to see the deception of working to earn a way into heaven or not even acknowledging there's a God. It's all about ourselves. Oh, Lord, speak to us. I feel like as I made the invitation earlier, it comes again and again because it's your desire that men would be saved. Many people here are, and we rejoice in that, but God, I feel you're calling us to a deeper level, and I believe there are those here that need to make that decision today. Not just to be baptized, but to say, I'm part of the family of God. I'm not going to take the mark of the world, mark of the beast. I'm going to trust you. So move among us, God, as we have been moving all service. Boy, it's been a great, great to come before you together and worship. Thank you. Thank you for being so faithful to us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.